Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the fourth episode of Muslims of the Melting Pot. Today we are talking to Suhaib Webb. He is a Muslim American scholar, thought leader, and educator. And after converting to Islam at only 20 years old, Suhaib Webb left a career in the music industry to pursue his passion in education. After serving as an imam and scholar in various Muslim communities across the United States, he went to Cairo, Egypt to attend Al-Azhar University and study Islamic law. Specifically, Sahib Webb is a proponent of understanding the various challenges faced by the American Muslim community and finding authentic ways to address those challenges within a Muslim and Islamic framework. Total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Because it's the That's only it. religion that acts like the mafia. They're not immigrants. They're, they're invaders. Let they're not finish. immigrants. This clash of civilizations. And if they're not going to learn to assimilate, I don't want them in this country. But hold up. That's not really who we are. Perhaps the American melting pot model is not an accurate depiction of the true Muslim American experience. And perhaps the goal is not to mix. But if it isn't, then what really is? To assimilate or not to assimilate? That's the question. I'm your host, Sarah Salimi, and you are watching Muslims of the Melting Pot. Thank you, Saheb Webb, for being our fourth guest and welcome to the podcast. Well, first of all, thank you, Sarah, for having me on here. It's a pleasure. I enjoy your podcast, and um, I'm glad to see that it's growing and developing and, and really appreciate the fact that you have so many kind of diverse guests and you're deliberate about doing that. And I think it's amazing. So I want to start us off with this conversation about your personal journey to Islam and how that came to be, kind of what led you to the journey of finding Islam. I became Muslim in 1992. Uh, I was just, I just turned 20 years old and largely due to uh, people that I knew in the music business that I was engaged with, as well as a very good friend of mine who was Muslim um, through high school. And so that led me to sort of start reading, right? That was before, in, the, in, in those days, the impulse for the internet wasn't quite there yet. The impulse was still like, let me go to the library or let me pick up a book. So I, I, began to read the Quran when I was like 17 years old in English. And so that led me to ultimately embrace Islam when I was 20. I actually read, I think it was online, that you, you were a DJ before you actually converted to Islam. And so can you tell us a little bit about the experience of what, what spark kind of led you to even be intrigued in looking into the religion? Well, I, I began to doubt my, my parents' faith. And they were members of what's called the Church of Christ, Christianity. At a really young age, and I had questions, and not to offend any of your listeners, but like, why would God commit murder? Like, why would you kill your son? Um, right. The idea of original sin was something that I, I even, like 13, 14 years old, sort of grappled with before my baptism. Because before baptism, my grandfather was actually a Christian preacher. He was running churches. Oh. My father went to Pepperdine. He went to Columbia Christian. This is not like coming from someone who was uneducated because oftentimes i know people say oh well that person didn't know this religion or right. that religion you are very much but within the religion itself. i wasn't a scholar i was 13 but i knew enough to grapple with some of the major theological issues and one of them right. was like the idea of original sin people are bored guilty and i was just like well how do you reconcile that with the idea of transcendent justice like god is just why am i being punished for the decision of someone else the portrayal of God within churches as being like a white man. I always found that sort of like, it's odd. You go to like a black church, he looks like, you know, Usher. You go to a Latino church. And I was just like, wow, like everybody's kind of projecting themselves onto what they think God is. I began to have sort of uh, a crisis in that sense, a logical crisis. And so then I started reading. And, you know, honestly, I thought Muslims were kind of like insane, you know, prior to that. But through DJing, I had a number of friends, like the guy I used to work for, his name was Hamza. He wasn't even Muslim. His brother's name was Latif. And so they actually had a Quran in the studio, which is like insane. And I would just look at him like, man, the thing is, hey, you know, interesting. There was a number of, and I think that's something that we have to appreciate about um, people who embrace Islam, is that oftentimes right. it, it's a set of particulars that lead to the whole. Right. It's exactly. not just like the Pauline Epiphany or Sayyidina Muhammad and Ali Salam in the cave of Hira who has mm -hmm. that's a prophetic experience. Ours are, are right. non prophetic, oftentimes clumsy, sloppy, accidental, 
um, and just a mixture of so many things. And I think a lot of people assume that conversion is this linear process. Like you suddenly wake up or are inspired in a dream and the next day you're a Muslim. But it's actually interesting because a lot of times it's in the depths of sin that some people find God. It's in the depths of, you know, feeling that they don't have that purpose. They kind of feel a sense of gap in their soul where they do go after that intrinsic fitra placed inside them to search for that deeper meaning. And we believe that sin is imbalance, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. epistemologically and theologically framed as imbalance. And so right. when there's cognitive dissonance, kind of like Piaget theory, people seek to find in the Quran, right? So that imbalance ideally should cause someone to seek that balance. That's so yeah, so that's sort of where I was at that age in my life. And so as, as an evidence, I thought I was Muslim, like for three years. I thought I was Muslim. Right. I didn't know about Shahada. I was around Muslims. I actually was attending a weekly study circle and no one ever asked me to embrace Islam. So the, uh, the idea of, you know, Muslims aggressively kind of evangelicizing people and I didn't experience that. And so then I, I, right. I, I took my Shahada like seamlessly just, oh yeah, I'm Muslim. I'm already Muslim. I was actually yeah. going to ask you because I know a, a lot of people will say it's not convert because a revert is someone who just comes back to the initial or the original idea that we have that everyone's born Muslim. Right. So the word, first of all, convert and revert is not something we really chose. It was sort of right. imposed on us. And then mm -hmm. secondly is it's historically inaccurate. And revert is just a bad usage of the language. I don't want to put on my professor cap now, but I would, right. I would not pass someone yeah. who used that active participle. New Muslim does two things that I think is really important. Number one is it does allow us to frame new Muslims as being still in need of learning. Obviously, just because I become Muslim, I shouldn't think that I, I know. But then it also respects the fact that there's a shelf life to being a new Muslim. After a while, now I'm part of the broader ummah. I'm not a subsect. Yeah. So it applies now a process of utility and growing into Absolutely. a relationship. Theologically, the whole idea of fitra being Islam is not correct. And I teach this at my school. And that's why people have to accept Islam. Unless they're born into mm -hmm. a Muslim family, and then it's understood that they've accultured into Islam. Right, but even that, from my experience and what I have seen, the new Muslims around us, I think that they actually have sometimes a much deeper grasp of the religion than a lot of us who are born into the faith. Which is why a lot of times what we have is even... For example, me, born into a religious family, essentially you can say inherited Islam as a religion. I think at various points in my life, I did have to really rediscover my religion for myself. Because it's not just that, you know, you have parents who are Muslim and now automatically you're Muslim and you have, you know, you're set. But it's the journey that you really do have to rediscover and essentially come to Islam yourself as well and accept it. Something that I know, for example, new Muslims or converts or reverts would not experience because they've there's a process of learning and knowledge and education that comes with making the conscious decision to convert to a religion. So I think there's two points to this question. Number one, it is considered within Sunni and Shia uh, theologies an obligation upon everyone born Muslim to learn the foundations of their religion. Exactly. They have to. So there's like a micro acceptance of Islam, even though they're already considered Muslim. But mm -hmm. for, for people like myself, I think we had to, if we're honest about our, our embrace of Islam, we invest in trying to learn at least the bare minimums. How did you kind of integrate within the Muslim community? Because I know a lot of Muslim communities, I say this from both experience and from hearing about it, are not very welcoming of new Muslims into their communities. And you see a lot of times that they feel either isolated or their struggles don't align as much so they don't feel heard. Or even the programming, something as simple as, you know, having lectures that are in English so that they can actually understand what's being said. How did that come off to you? And how did you kind of, what did you think of it? And that's something I failed in. I gave one time a lecture in Arabic because I was in a community that asked me to do it, right? And I'm, right. I'm from Oklahoma. Afterwards, a Muslim, a Muslim came to me and said, I don't. I embraced Islam five years ago, man. But like, bro, like, what are you doing? You know? And that was... What are you saying? And I was like, I'm, I'm so sorry. I was asked to give a talk in Arabic and I just... Didn't. He's like, yeah, you know what? You forgot about us. And I really appreciated that moment, even though it might have been a little uncomfortable for me. But uncomfortability, right. you know, when our muscles hurt, usually they're growing. And so I said to him, like, yeah. I really... And then I sat down with him and said, okay, this is everything I said. I just gave him the lecture. 
Well, I mean, it's good that you actually did that. That's not something that happens in a lot of communities. It's kind of like either you're going to be, you know, from the language we speak or, you know, find somewhere else to be, basically. And, and, so I became Muslim at a time when information was rare, so it was valuable. Like you didn't have the budget to waste your time with nonsense. Right. The second thing was my community was basically a student community. So they were all just like chilling, you know, they were all from like Karachi, Iran, Yemen, Saudi. Um, we were all very young, you know, so we were still like hanging out as young people. We were all poor, right? College <laughs> students. And then the third thing, there was a really great scholar in my area from West Africa who the night I embraced Islam came to me and he was like, these people will use your whiteness against you. He's like, you have to work hard. You have to work 10 times harder than everyone else because whiteness, I'm going to frame it in a way now we'd understand. It's like whiteness is utility. Right. And so I was like, wow, man, this guy's, because I was aware at that time of some of these things. And I was like, man, this dude gets it. So that next Tuesday, I was Alif Ba'atasa. And I memorized the Quran with him in two years. Wow. And so, yeah. So he, he. Marcella, I did not know that. Two years. There's Muslims who try for like decades to get that down. That's, that's very impressive. Well, I was 20. You know, a lot easier. Yeah, I entered into his like his hausa, right? His madrasa for 10 years. And right. then I went to Egypt and studied for seven years and finished my mufti course in Egypt. I felt as a new Muslim that I, I had a responsibility to get to know people in ways that right. made me uncomfortable. Do you think yeah. it helped that you were young? You were a young age when you converted to Islam. Do you think it, if you were older, it would have been more difficult? I think it would have been more difficult because I had more responsibilities that would have right. taken my time. Um, the fourth thing that I didn't mention, and this may sound weird is although my parents and family were sort of, and you asked about this earlier, I think right. were not necessarily happy. They were still somewhat supportive. That really helps. Yeah. So yeah. in the beginning there was tension, undoubtedly there was serious tension and I had to navigate that because I was financially reliant on my family. And I think also one thing that we don't hear is like, I love my parents, like just because I became Muslim, right. like. Doesn't mean I don't love my family anymore. So I felt, exactly. I felt like a duty to them that came even before my Islam. And so, but they allowed me to like study, like they allowed me okay. to go to school and then even to go to Madrasa, like mm -hmm. they facilitated that. Did you personally feel welcome in the community or did you feel that there was still that barrier? I think there was indifference from the older people. Like, I don't right. think they were antagonistic, but they just were like, but you know what? I'm going to be honest with you because I lived in the Muslim world for 10 years, you know, mm -hmm. that I don't really fault them because America is a hard place to navigate, you know? And if you are in America and you don't speak English, I was an imam of a community for three years. Most of the people there didn't speak English. They're also equally as kind of terrified. So I, I sort of didn't look at it as them being antagonistic to me. I was just like, they got issues and they got stuff they got to handle. I, I faced it a little bit. I saw with some of my, um, my, my, so a lot of my friends became Muslim with me. We were actually members of a gang and we all embraced Islam and many of them were, were black Americans and they ran into challenges. Wow. They ran into social challenges so. in the Muslim that I didn't face. And so right. that I was like, this is some post-colonial garbage, right? What would you say um, about the mixture or the integration of culture and religion? New Muslims who come into the faith have a much less cultural perspective to the religion than a lot of people who carry a lot of cultural baggage into their understanding of Islam. Let's say Iranians or Pakistanis or Arabs. Their understanding of religion is oftentimes very heavily influenced by their culture. And a lot of times, some elements of that culture are not necessarily inherently Islamic. So how would you say that differs from new Muslims' experiences? Yeah, culture is extremely important in Islam. We have the statement of Sayyidina Ali Karam Allah Wacha who says, you know, talk to people where they're at. And then we know that many times Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet, would have different answers to the same question because people right. are coming from a different experience or have different needs. This axiom runs across different Islamic legal schools, either Imam right. Jafar al-Sadiq or others, the four methods. We use theology to dehumanize, where theology actually is the investment in rahmah, humanization, healing, Absolutely. caring, and Nabi awla bil mu'minin. The Prophet is closer to you than you are to yourself. What you're saying is actually so critical because a lot of Muslims feel judged for the fact that they aren't at the peak of their religiosity at any given point. And I think that's sometimes forgotten in the process because 
we're so quick to label people as, oh, you're a you're a good Muslim, you're a bad Muslim, you're you know liberal Muslim, conservative Muslim, and sometimes we forget that there's a human there. And that's the outcome of postmodernity. I mean, if you look at Daesh, if you look at you know some of the more extreme cancerous representations of Islam in the world through just unapologetic violence. When you begin right. to look at the ideology, it has its roots in oftentimes the idea of the modern state, even through neoliberalism and conservatism. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a, a link back to pre-industrial age theology. It is right. very much the embodiment of a fascist mindset, which is the gift of transmodernity. You add social media to this. Why are people so brutal in comments? I'm sure it's happened to me. I'll meet people who are just bombarding me in the comments box, right? But then I meet them yeah. in person and they're like kittens. Exactly. Right? Or, that's, that's the irony. Be because now we've taken out the technocratic relationship and now we yeah. have to humanize each other. And I like to tell imams that I was training some, some months ago, to be an imam means that you are invested in an interdisciplinary approach. Or you have talented people around you who can help you see mm -hmm. things in different, through different disciplines primarily psychology, emotional. We have a lot of people who have childhood trauma. Exactly. Whether through religious teachers or their own parents. Uh, we see young women who have, have bulimia and anorexia because they were always told they were fat, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing happens with religion. When people are constantly exposed to religion being this guilt enforcement. And that's actually important that you bring that up because a lot of Muslims who are born into the faith because from childhood they aren't raised with this correct understanding of God and religion, they're almost raised, you know, feeling that any given action they do is immediately going to translate into either heaven or hell. We believe that God in his names, he is full of mercy. He is mercy itself. He is love itself. He is the truth itself. And sometimes we fail to kind of connect those dots because we only see him as, oh, the one who takes revenge. And I find that also missing in a lot of, you know, scholarly work is that a lot of times scholars fail to really see the issues that young Muslims are facing in a society where all traces of religion have virtually ceased to exist. Absolutely. I think that there's that's a lot you're talking about. It's amazing. <laughs> I, I, and I think also that there's three parts sort of what you said that I took. But I think also the power of the global ethos is one which is inherently Western, whether we admit it or not. Psychology is led now by a Western framework. History is led by a, fr a Western framework. I mean, you and I will not pass the academy if we write a PhD, you know, using, say, Razi's theory of, you know, a non-anachronistic world. Right. So we are now subjugated. We are colonized intellectually. And, exactly. And, and so what this forces people to do, because the altar of Western post-Hellenistic modernity is the individual. The individual is the qibla. The individual is the mihrab. There's no idea of community. And the birth of social media has only put it on steroids. It has inflamed the idea of, you know, people are, are having their own, you know, everything from learning a language to having a physical relationship now is happening online. Exactly. Right. And, and, and now you add AI to this. Oh my goodness. Right. We have to have a whole episode on AI. And, and so, and I don't think that these things are also like they're necessarily evil, but I think without non-Western frameworks, it's going to only lead to people being further isolated because this is the history of the West. And I, I'm not saying that I'm not, you know, to blast anybody. It's just, it is what it is. It, it believes right. in the power of Michael Jordan with his tongue out dunking on everybody. It, it's a society that uses violence as the apex of imposition and success. It's the cowboy world. And so that's Absolutely. why it's almost impossible to imagine the modern state without you and I realizing that they can inflict upon us doom without any recourse. And Absolutely. I think the Palestinians are a great example of this. They are the complete object of absolute tyranny and injustice and the failure of the world mm -hmm. and black people and brown people and the poor whites as well. The angst of the Trumpist was largely rooted in a failure for them to have any like economic utility. There's a great book called Strangers in Their Own Land that really details that angst. And it's a misdirected anger, but it is a legitimate anger in some ways, not always. And what's going to happen now is instead of sitting upstairs and drinking tea and talking with a hundred aunties and uncles, I got a freaking virtual friend. Like, And that's the danger of right. it really is that 
everyone's kind of sitting behind this barrier of a phone and not making any real connections in the real world and replacing them with these pseudo real connections that are ironically or in a contradictory way doing the opposite of what they're supposed to do. They're not making us more happy. They're not making us more fulfilled in our relationships. They're kind of creating a deep gaping hole that we don't even realize it's is being grown over time. And that's why everybody's mad and rude. A social commitment is now look through the lens of me and my little AI friend. I mean, a part of it is whether you like it or not, being involved in the social sphere, the social media world is kind of like a, a pill that you have to take because it's, you know, it's what the time calls for. Whether you want to be a religious figure, a scholar, an influencer, not all influencers. If you want to be anyone who's really having a voice for good or for bad, social media is something you can't avoid, which is why the question becomes, at one point, can you say it's really doing more harm than good? By no means am I invoking a complete rejection. But history shows us something in America. Great, great historian Zahir Ali, a brilliant black historian in the Muslim community, third, fourth generation Muslim. Right. A genius. We were talking and he said to me that historically in the West, three types of religious communities have kind of battled with this great question that you and I are talking about. Right. The first were those who completely rejected any idea of assimilation, assimilation right? They don't last long. Those are your cults, right? Those, those are groups that kind of come and go or lead to like violence, right? And we see some of the sovereignist movements now through white supremacy kind of head in that direction. The second are those who completely assimilate, right? They also don't last. And the third are those who are thinking critically and constructively about engagement and they end up lasting because they have a realistic, like you said, we got to take this pill. It's a tough pill to swallow. Now that I've accepted the fact that I have to, to swallow this pill, what is the strategy to mitigate its danger? I think every religious group at this time, especially, is really battling with this question, especially religious groups that really want to retain that identity factor, the religious identity, while also recognizing that you need to have an influence in the real world, especially in the Western world, if you want to retain a voice and have your rights, is figuring out this question. And I don't think there's any easy answer to it. What I noticed, in, and I think it has a lot to do with Generation Z and young millennials who have... Generation Z, by the way, is just a different breed. I love of them, man. That's, that's, they remind me of us. My daughter's Generation Z. When I give talks to them. I have to kind of tone it down because they're ready to go. You know what I mean? And you know why? Because they escaped the shadow of 9-11. And, and sometimes I don't know if they appreciate, and I think that's a broader conversation to have with millennials, the trauma, the historic geographical trauma providential trauma that millennials had to deal with like i was pulled off airplanes fbi came to my house i was subpoenaed i was i had my bank accounts frozen Are you really gone through the whole range right and i did nothing and then eventually i got to the point where isis wanted to kill me they put a hundred thousand dollar bounty on my head you know like i'm dealing with this this broad intrusive unabated political power that's crushing me as an imam in oh America, post 9-11. Well, maybe we should not be having this podcast anymore. <laughs> but see, that's what I had to struggle with. People would abandon me. Exactly. Right? And so you're saying that as a joke, but and then, but Muslims got my back. So I'm, I'm between two. Generation Z didn't have to deal with that. And also they're brave. Yeah. They just don't give a, give a darn, you know? They're just like, yeah. whatever. What do you think can be done to kind of address a lot of these issues, but also bring in that unity factor among Muslims that's so missing these days. I think we have to honestly admit that unity will never happen until Mahdi comes. It's not a lost cause, but I think it goes back to what you and I talked about. You said the pill you got to swallow. Right. Why? Because if we look at Muslims, we have 57 ethnicities and within those 57 states are tribes. Even within a given culture, you have microcultures. Right. Then the second is how people practice Islam. I don't think it's just Sunni Shia. I think with even in, in, in Sunni Shia, you have layers of that. Like you have the Hujatiya, right? You have the Shirazi Shias who, hey, 100%. they're not about. They don't get along. Yeah, you know, that's the reality. Like, and they're kind of like Madkhali Salafis on the Sunni side, right? And then you have mm -hmm. followers of Imam Khomeini, Allah Yerhamu, who are more like unity. We pray with Sunnis. You have Sunnis who follow Sheikh Shaltut and Al-Azhar. 
pray with Shia. We acknowledge differences. We need to respect those differences. You have people like Sheikh Hassan Nasrullah who's like, we shouldn't be cursing the Sahaba. Right. And you have Sunnis like Imam Abu Zahra wrote a whole book called Al Sadiq about Imam Jafar al Sadiq. And Sunnis were like, we had no idea that Imam Jafar al Sadiq was like a mujtahid. He had his own medhab. Right. So within that, that's a lot to sort of let's all get along. You know what I mean? Yeah. And what you said is key. It's we forget to acknowledge that the differences are there and that it's fine to have differences. No one's just going to come, you know, propose a solution where everyone just is like, oh, wow, I never thought of that. That's just about to solve unity once and for all. It's kind of like we're going to have those differences. How are we going to respond to them, though? And unity has always been state enforced. We just have to acknowledge that, right? And we also have to be careful that we don't become left or right. We're prophetic. That's a whole different issue. We're on like a, a sense of justice that is prophetically driven. I don't trust the left. I don't trust the right. What Malcolm said, a fox and a wolf, I think it holds truth. The left always uses moral judgments to advance its own kind of gain. The right uses moral judgments to enforce white supremacy. We're like in the middle. So I think... Just trying to do our own thing right. and everyone attacks us for it. Or, or we attack each other now. Exactly. So I think unity at a global level will not happen until Sayyidina Isa comes and Sayyidina Mahdi comes. Like, it ain't going to happen. I don't know. Allah Allah. 100%. And for the convert, we get lost in the middle of all that. And I, and I think what you're going to see, and I know we're running out of time, is that convert leadership and convert presence has begun to erode. Why do you think that is? It's not necessarily a bad thing. I just think it's a reality of people who came from Muslim countries have had a lot of kids. And their kids have sort of stepped into religious leadership, scholarship, influencers, right. and sort of pushed out, not on purpose, the role of the Salafuddin's, the Suhaib Webs, and the others. And I think most importantly, we as converts did not build our own institutions. We have failed ourselves. Because if you think about it, just as Generation Z is an important strategic entry point into presenting Islam in a dynamic way, can you imagine if you had like mosques that were like largely led and ran by people who embraced Islam? The impact they would have on... I think that would be beautiful. And I also think that that would be much more welcoming to people who are not Muslim and point. are interested in the faith. So that's why I think having sort of our own places allows us to sort of, with the idea of unity with other mosques and communities, but new Muslims haven't put financial investment. So I don't know one imam in america that's a new muslim or was a new right. muslim that is supported by new muslims we have this problem across different muslim communities even the ones that identify specifically culturally it's we have a problem with supporting our own mosques and our own scholars and our own initiatives that come within the community i run a full-time house online right i have a thousand mm -hmm. subscribers so imagine out of almost one million facebook followers hundred something thousand instagram people nine dollars a month in fact people will complain to me i paid nine dollars a month for this i'm like do you complain for your coffee and the reason netflix yes. how about we talk about yeah. the elephant in the room okay netflix and, and you, you can know? share your password with me yeah exactly <laughs> but the point We're is like sharing with everyone in their family do so you know what it is it's that people do not want it's like we have this unstated bias in our mind that anything religion related has to be free this is a disaster you can't scale look at the koreans who came to america the south koreans look at the churches they built in the last 20 years compared to us who embraced it like i blame us i don't like blaming your parents and the uncles and aunties because we didn't build we we we're from here we can build like we have the language we know the culture we know the people right and then what happens is and i don't like this is nativism and they start, we, we hear Muslims who are new to the faith or second generation new to the faith blaming your parents that, oh, they didn't help us out. That's not their job. Like, let's be honest. That's not their job. Everyone, everyone's really looking for a scapegoat. Right. That's what it is. But look at the Koreans. They didn't wait for those white people to come and build evangelical churches for them. So I'd like to put the onus on us if we were really about our passion for Islam and embracing Islam and Islam is the haq, we would be getting busy. We wouldn't be complaining and blaming people. Well, thank you so much for, for your enlightening words. I really, really am thankful for your insight. And I'm so happy to have heard your experience because I really do think the new Muslim experience is something we hear very little of. And I think it's so important to value those words. And I hope you benefited from it as well. Mamnoon, mamnoon. 
And thank you all for joining us in this fourth episode with Saheb Webb. We hope you enjoyed this very important conversation surrounding the new Muslim experience in the West. And we hope you join us for future episodes. Assalamu alaikum.